Welcome back to this last and final part of the uncertainty quantification series. In this video we want to have a look at how we can implement the methods for estimating epistemic uncertainty that we've discussed in the last video. In particular this refers to Bayesian neural networks, Monte Carlo dropout and deep ensembles. So this is the Colab notebook that we've used last time for estimating aleatoric uncertainty with these different methods and I've created a new section for epistemic uncertainty with a note. So in order to run this section you first have to execute this first cell which generates the data set that we've used last time. So just as a quick reminder we have a train set that is distributed like this and we also have a test set that has a larger input range. So this one is from minus 7 to plus 7 and this one from minus 10 to plus 10. And what we expect now for the epistemic models is that they report in high uncertainty in this area because this is data that the model has never seen before. So we will use the same data set and because of that first execute this cell and then you can jump down here and continue with this epistemic block. So here we have three very basic implementations for Bayesian neural nets, Monte Carlo dropout and deep ensembles. And let me emphasize that I didn't invest much time into hyperparameter tuning. So I'm pretty sure that you can get much more out of these models, but this is just a very basic variant how you can implement them to make them report epistemic uncertainty for the predictions. So let's have a look at Bayesian neural nets. Of course the question is how do you implement that because you have to put a distribution on the weights and also support uh, backpropagation with this reparameterization trick. And there are different choices for BNNs. You can use libraries like Pyro, which are probabilistic libraries. But there's also a very simple library called Blitz that I found on GitHub. And Blitz supports these Bayesian layers and all of them basically allow you to have a distribution on the weights and also support the full PyTorch backpropagation process. So we will quickly install Blitz, which is called Blitz Bayesian PyTorch on pip. And we will also import some of the previous uh, modules we used. And now let's jump right into the model. So the way how this works now is that we simply use the layers from blitz.modules and build our simple network with it. In this case, we use Bayesian linear layers that are simply fully connected layers. And here we have one single input feature, which is our X value. And we output one single prediction. And with that, we can build our network. And there's nothing different from a regular network. Now, in order to make this work, we need to put a decorator to this module, which is called variational estimator. And this also comes from Blitz. And with this, we are able to calculate things like the loss, so this variational inference loss. So by adding this, we basically make it a Bayesian network. Now, we can also have a look at this network by simply printing it, and we see it's just like before those three linear layers, but we also see that inside of these layers we have some additional things now. Usually you would only have your weights. In this case we have two distributions for the weight and two distributions for the bias. And on one hand we have the prior distributions which model our prior knowledge and are probably just simple Gaussian distributions. And then we have these trainable random distributions. And in order to make those distributions trainable, we need to apply the reparametrization trick. And this means we sample outside of the network, which is all handled by Blitz, and we simply predict the parameters of this, these distributions in order to apply this variational inference. Just like before, I also have a function that plots the predictions. And in a Bayesian neural net, the way it works is that we just predict several times. And here we have a sample size of 100, which means we, we iterate over the samples. And 
for each sample we give it the same input and this gives us a list of predictions and what we can do now is calculate the mean and standard deviation on these predictions and this gives us these confidence bands which we can visualize with a little bit of plotting down here. Because we previously added this decorator to our model, we now have access to some additional functions and one of them is for example called sample elbow. The idea is that we want to do sampling based variational inference here, which means we want to approximate the posterior distribution and do this by sampling a loss. And with this function we can sample the loss function for a specific input. Now the loss function in our case is the evidence lower bound that I've explained in the last video. It consists of two parts. One is the likelihood, which is our actual criterion. So in this case we use just the mean squared error. And the other one is the KL divergence that checks how close we are to the prior distribution. And with those two we can calculate the loss and there is also a different function called sample elbow explicit, I think. And with this one we can actually get the individual losses for KL divergence and the likelihood. In this case both losses are combined according to this complexity cost weight. So this sort of weighs the KL divergence against our target criterion. So long story short, we simply use this sample elbow function on our model and pass it the inputs, the labels, the criterion, how many times we want to sample and this weight for our costs between KL divergence and likelihood. And I have a loop here that runs over 100 epochs and every 10 epochs I have a test loop that simply tests the predictions and plots them just like we had it before. Now let's have a look at these predictions. So this is the result after 90 epochs of training and we see that the uncertainty outside of our distribution, so on the left of this bar and on the right of this one, is quite high compared to the uncertainty in the middle. What makes me wonder a bit is why this area and this area also seem to have a high uncertainty. Because the model has seen a lot of data points and therefore I think the uncertainty should also be lower. So I'm not 100% satisfied with this result, but this is what I got after a couple of hours of tweaking parameters. So the next method we want to have a look at is Monte Carlo dropout. And this one is actually pretty straightforward to implement. The only thing we need is a dropout layer. And we can use this dropout layer several times because it's not specific to one of these layers. And here I selected a dropout rate of 0.2. I read that in the paper they also use higher dropout rates like 0.5, but I found lower values to work better in my case. And just like before, I also have a plotting function now and the important part here is that we use the model in training mode because typically if you put your model into test mode by calling model.eval you turn off dropout. And in this case we want to use dropout also for our predictions. And just like before we sample several times, in this case 100, and each time we get a different dropout set and because of that we get some variation on the parameters and using that we can get an estimate of the uncertainty in our parameters. And we use the means and standard deviations of this sampled output distribution and plot them just like before. And nothing new here, we train the model in a train and test loop and print the results. And we can see after some yeah, after almost 100 iterations, we get this picture where we see that the uncertainty in the middle is again lower than the uncertainty outside of the, of the training distribution. 
Again, this is not perfect, but I think it shows a tendency that we have a higher uncertainty outside of the distribution and also for specific areas of the inputs, but a very high certainty in, in this middle area compared to that. Now, the last model on today's agenda are deep ensembles and those are also straightforward to implement. Basically, it's just an ensemble of different networks. And for that, I've created a simple network that I've also used before. And this network actually predicts mu and sigma or variance. And this means we can use this model to predict aleatoric uncertainty and use the, the ensemble to predict epistemic uncertainty. And the idea now is that we have several of these models. And for each of these models, I now get the predictions. And eventually, we use the variance in all of these predictions. And again, I can use them to plot these sort of confidence bands. Now, how does this look like in practice? We just define a number of models. And here I simply stack these models according to how many models I want to have. And for each of these models, we can use the same loss function, but we have to consider that we need to use different optimizers because each optimizer uses the parameters of one specific model. And in the training loop, we can now simply iterate over this deep ensemble and for each of the models, we can get the predictions and we simply optimize each model individually, but then report a common loss for the whole ensemble. And yeah, in this test loop, we simply plot the results. And again, we iterate over the models. I have to say that I've also seen different approaches that might do it more efficiently, but this is the most straightforward way to implement it. And the results of that look like this. Here we have a similar picture as before. We have a high uncertainty outside of the distribution and the lower one in the middle of the distribution. And again, we have some ranges where the model also reports high uncertainty. Again, I still don't know why this happens. I would need to further investigate this, but as this was a very simple tutorial with this dummy data set, I didn't go further into detail, but generally it shows that we can certainly capture, especially out of distribution uncertainty and also uh, the areas where our model is quite certain. So that's all for this uncertainty in deep learning series. I hope that you found it interesting or helpful. Also feel free to leave a comment if you have any questions for the models or for the implementation. and. I think that I will do some more videos in that direction in the future because I find uncertainty in deep learning a very interesting and important topic. And let me know what you think about it. And I see you soon in a future video.